Good morning and welcome to the special service online which we're going to continue even though this morning right now I'm probably worshipping at Secret Harbor Hall with a lot of our church members because we got the privilege of opening up again. So if you are in the area and you want to join us next week come join us at 9 o'clock at Secret Harbor Community Center in the south of Perth. Um, we're going to continue this online ministry because we realize that a lot of you are actually joining from regional areas and also from overseas. So we want to welcome you. And that's why we're going to continue in the next couple of weeks with continuing this recorded service. And so join in as we worship God together. Speaking of which, this year, our church is focusing on Jesus Christ, our perfect vision, 2020. And if you want to join us with our series, we on a Sunday morning, we share the message. But then you can go into more detail on your own time with the study guide. It's free. We'd like to send that through you with an electronic version to you. So you can email us, nathan at deogloria.org.au. And if you want any more information about our church, who we are, what we're about, but log on to the link below. While we're busy sharing with you, you might have children who are younger. There's also some information and some activities that they can do, which are online for you free of charge as well. If you want to join a small group, because we value discipleship in small groups, then, and you're overseas or you're in a regional area, contact us. Send us an email. We might, we'll be able to help you to link with another small group. And this, this, this technology and what we've been taught over COVID, during this COVID-19 period is how to use electronic, electronics, is how to use technology to meet up with people and talk about God's Word. So we want to encourage you, if you're not in a small group and you're in a regional or in overseas, we want to like you to join one, then please send us that email. We've also got some youth activities happening on this Friday. So this Friday night at Secret Harbor Hall at half past six to seven o'clock. Uh, that's when we start. So just join us there. We're going to have some fun youth events again. So that'll be fun to see you there. Let us just uh, bow our heads in prayer as we come before God our Father. God, as we then start the day, we start the day in your presence. Father, you're sitting on your throne. you watching us. you seeing what we're doing. We, you, you, you want to, us to turn to you and, and just express our love to you and our need for you. And you'd love to hear from us. So this morning, we come to you in prayer with the expectation, knowing that you're with us, knowing that you're listening but also knowing that you want to talk to us. You want to speak to us and influence us and help us and guide us. We're going to do that through your word this morning. So we open. We come to you and we saying we open to hear from you, Lord God. And then with these praises, we then lift you up in worship. Amen.
you can open up your Bibles to Psalm 119. We'll be reading from 33 to 40 this morning. Psalm 119, verse 33 to 40. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding, so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, preserve my life. In our series, which we're focusing on in the next few weeks, we're focusing on God's Word, the importance of the Word of God in our lives. And this is one of the foundations and the pillars of us as a church, that the church is built on God's Word. It's built on Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, and on His Word. And so the Word of God should have a high priority, a high value in the life of the church and in our lives. We see that from the psalmist. Last week we noticed in the previous verses, in verses 9 to 16, we noticed how the psalmist had a high value of God's Word. What do we mean by high value? We mean that he didn't see God's Word as just another book. We didn't see God's Word as just another uh, book about God. We didn't, it doesn't, he didn't see God's Word about another history book or a guideline for our lives. No. The high value which the psalmist and we have for God as a church and the body of Christ is that it is the words of God. It came directly from God and it speaks to us today just like it spoke to the psalmist in those days. And because of the high value which the psalmist and we have, we should have approach the word of God in the right way. What is the approach? The approach is with the right heart. An open heart. A willing heart. With a willing mind. Which is with our right emotions. And with the right actions which goes with that. Because if you aren't open to the Word of God, the Word of God won't mean anything to you. And so this morning, we open to learn because we are God's children. His Spirit is in us. And the Spirit is going to teach us from His Word and show us truths which are going to impact our lives forever. So as we look then at the details of this song, my focus this morning is on teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord. But it's built. The verses 33 to 36 shows us how he's asking, teach me, Lord, the way of your district decrees. Give me understanding. Direct me. Turn my heart. So he's turn my eyes. So 36, 30, 30 verse 33 to 37a. He's keep on saying, teach me, teach me, teach me. I want to learn. I'm open. I'm yearning for that. But you've got to ask our question, why is this person and the psalmist so open to knowing more of God's ways and to following God's ways? What motivates us to be taught? I think back when I was younger, then there's a lot of things that I enjoyed. I enjoyed fishing. I enjoyed playing golf. There's also some subjects at school I enjoyed. And there were motivating factors why I wanted to be taught these things. In fishing, uh, I, I knew that, you know what, I want to learn how to put a hook on. I want to you know, know how to turn, a, uh, put the knot on, tie the knot, so I can go and catch uh, quick uh, when I get to the river, but I know how to do it myself, and I can actually then help myself one day. Because I enjoyed fishing. Um, I, I wanted to play golf and I wanted to learn the technique. So I spent time in learning about the techniques of golf and in putting it into practice. Because I reckoned I enjoyed golf because that was, that was my, one of my desires. I wanted to become a professional golf player. And then second of all, I also reckoned that I can make a lot of money out of playing golf. So there were motivating factors behind the desire to be taught. Enjoying it. Plus I could see the value of that in my life. 
Um, obviously, these examples are a bit uh, obscure because there's, there's more value in God's ways and God's word than there is to these motivating factors. So we've got to look at the psalmist then and say, but what was the motivating factors behind his desire and eagerness to be taught? Because he was teachable. And we see it quite clearly. So before we gain, go into the whole teaching aspect about what does he mean by God teach me, let's look at the motivating factors behind being taught because there has to be a desire. He had the right approach. He has the heart for God in his ways and therefore he wants to be taught. He's got openness. And the motivating factor found in this passage lies in the second half of the text. 33 to 36 and 37 as well A includes the teach me. 37B to 40 shows the motivating factors and here it comes. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. So motivating factor number one is he found value, life giving preservations in God's word and in God. He knew that God is the life giver. Second of all, we see it then a little bit further in verse 39. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. Motivating factor number two, God's ways are good. So let's focus on these first of all. Verse 37, preserve my life according to your word. You see, the psalmist found the secret to life. He found that desire that every person has is to live an enjoyable life, but second of all, and most importantly, have eternal life. And that came through God. And it comes to us through Jesus Christ. 1 John 5 verse 11 verse 12 says exactly that. It says, and this is the testimony. This is it. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. How does God preserve our lives? First of all, He preserves our life through His Son, Jesus Christ, who came and died for us, who forgives us of our sins, and who gives us life. Jesus Himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So that's the motivating factor. We saw that in our first years as we said we want to fix our eyes as a church and as believers on Jesus Christ. He's our everything. And second of all, then He gives us His life-giving Spirit which is in us, which is testifying we are His children and saying we have life. And then out of that motivating factor, he says, all right, because I know God, I know Jesus, because eternal life is knowing Jesus, is being in a personal relationship with Jesus, knowing Him, and knowing that you'll spend the rest of eternity with Him because of what He's done for us, because of His love for you as His child. And then second motivating factor, out of that, out of a love for God, out of a love for what Jesus has done, he says, okay, I want to, I'm motivated because God, I want to live by your ways because your ways are good. Your ways are good. The world's ways I've seen are not good. My life I've seen, the way that I want to live my life and go off, the worthless things aren't good. Your ways are good. And he reflects this also as the psalm. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So somewhere in this, the psalmist's life, he's experienced God. He's experienced God's goodness, his preservation in his life, giving joy. And he's, and he's, and he's experienced God's goodness in following his ways. And so because of that experience of that goodness of God and His ways, He's expressing it in a prayer and He's saying, God, I want to follow you. Teach me. Teach me, Lord. Psalm 38 verse 4 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. Happy is the one who takes refuge in God. So being under His life-giving presence, protection, purpose, 
provision, power, experiencing the joy of Jesus in his life, and then saying, God, okay, I want to commit myself. I want to be teachable. Teach me, God, because your ways are good. It's the same as, the, as, as Isaiah wrote. Isaiah also experienced God in this level. So personal that he wrote and he said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. And he's reflecting the heart of God, where God is showing him, Isaiah, my thoughts are not like your thoughts. Your ways are not like my ways. My ways are better. My ways are good. My ways are awesome. Your ways, mankind's ways, and thoughts, where does that leave you? Think about it like this. If we look at the news in the last week or so, What's happening in the world? Surely we can see with our own eyes that man's ways are not like God's. There's death. There's destruction. There's violence in protests. Man's ways are not like God's ways. That's not how God created mankind to live by. But we followed our own ways. And the psalmist knows that and he's looking around in the world around him and he's also seeing that, you know what, the sinful ways of my own life and the people around me and the world around me is not good. Now, I've seen that God's ways are good and he's saying, teach me then your ways, Lord. Teach me your ways. And so, he's motivated then. By the preservation of life, God's life giving love, His Spirit giving us eternal life through Jesus Christ, and He's motivated by God's good ways. And so, out of that, that must be our motivation as well. We've experienced God, we've experienced His presence, His power, His purpose, His protection, His provisions, and we're saying, Yes, God, I know that I've tasted and seen. I know your goodness, I know your glory, I know when I'm walking this way on this path of destruction, it's not good for me. I know that when I'm following your ways, it's good for me, it's life giving, I'm enjoying my life, I delight in your ways. And so, Lord, I want, I'm open, teach me now. Teach me. So we've got to ask ourselves, have we experienced and tasted and seen that the Lord is good? If you have, then we're saying this morning, come Lord Jesus, teach me even more. If you haven't and you have the desire, then let's ask the question like Isaiah 55 asks in the beginning of that text. Come, all who are thirsty. Come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good. And what is good is a life within God, a life in God's Word and experiencing God through His Word. And that's where God comes in later and He says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake their, war, their ways and the righteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and He will have mercy on them and to our God for He will freely pardon them. And then verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. God's ways are far more greater than the ways that we see in the world. Where is the world learning about love? Where is the world learning about life? Where is the world learning about sex? Where is the world learning about money? The world is learning this by media, in movies, in the newspapers. And it's mind-blowing to actually think that the very people who are displaying this type of character, who's displaying this type of life, the wrong way, 
are the very people who are actually making money out of it, first of all, by showing this, and second of all, then by criticizing the world when they protest, by criticizing the world in their news stories when people are killing each other, by criticizing the world when, by, by, by looking at how people are living their lives, and they, they are the very ones that are teaching the world wrong. And the psalmist knows it because he saw it even in his own life and he's looked at the world around him and he knows that's the wrong way of living because it's hurting people. We're living in a broken, unstable world and we're crying out as we watch the news and we're crying out because that's not how God created the world. That's not God's ways. That's not His thoughts. And the psalmist is saying, God, I've experienced you and I've experienced your ways and I want to live like that because it's life giving to people. It brings hope. It brings joy. And Lord, that's motivating me. So come, teach me. Teach me. You see, because the opposite is that we look at God's word and we, and we hear the pastor saying, no, you've got to obey God's word. And God's word saying, obey me. And we're thinking, oh, it's all about a set of rules. No. It's all about God's goodness. And the joy He wants to give to mankind as we love Him and we love one another. And God is calling us to be followers to be disciples. That is what a disciple is. Someone who walks after Jesus, behind Him, following in His footsteps, loving like He he loved, being kind to people like He was kind to people, forgiving people like He was. And then we're going to see the world around us change. And He's calling us not to be people who have an understanding of God's Word and know His Word. He's calling us to follow and obey His Word because then the world will look different. And the psalmist knows that he's experienced that goodness. He says, okay, Lord, teach me. How teachable are you this morning? Because of God who's motivating you, is giving us life and His goodness. How teachable are you? And so he prayed, just like the psalmist prayed, teach us, Lord, because we have a desire We have the right approach towards God. And where does God teach us? He teaches us from His Word. If you want to hear God's voice, if you want to hear God's plans for your life, if you want to know God's purpose, if you want to experience His presence, we know that through the Spirit who is in us, we can experience all of that through God's Word. And so he says, teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees that I may follow it to the end. What was the goal of being taught? His goal was not to know the Word of God. I watched a funny video clip this week where a little boy was sitting at his desk at school and he had the pages open and he was going, and he was going, he was going like this. He was, he was taking his hand and he was, and then he was going, I'm turning the page and then turning the page. And he would do this all the way through because why? He was looking for this knowledge. But many people are like this little boy who just want to get this knowledge into their minds as quick as possible. But the aim, the goal is not to have knowledge. The goal is not to memorize scripture like that little boy. He's he's trying to get it in. It's not the goal. The goal is to follow God's word. God's calling us to be followers. Go and make disciples, teaching them and teaching them to obey to be followers. You see, it's a two-step process. I think of the dance, the two-step, or any dance. When a little girl comes to the father and says, Daddy, teach me to dance. What does the father do? The father says, right, put your foot onto my foot because the foot are little, these are little small feet and it's not going to hurt. And she puts her little feet onto the dad's feet and then the father takes her hands and he says, right, you look into my eyes and then you, all you do is you move where I'm moving. And then you follow me. And what does she have to do? She just has to trust. She just has to relax. And then she just has to follow his direction. And then what happens? There's this beautiful dance that takes place between a father and daughter. And eventually that, that daughter grows up and learns how to dance because of the way that she followed her dad's footsteps. We're in a close relationship with God. 
And all he's saying, he's saying, follow me. Let me direct you. Put your feet on me. Trust me. Trust me when I'm taking you. I've got you in my arms. This is the way, the, this is the ways, my laws, the ways that I want you to live. My thoughts are good for you. Look into my eyes. I'm your father. You my child. Trust me. When I say that adultery and living in a relationship with someone else and you're not married is wrong, trust me, it's wrong. Follow my ways. If you're living a life of sin where you're stealing at work and, and you're stealing time from your... It's wrong. Trust me. Follow my ways. My ways are good. If there's unforgiveness in your life, trust me when I say in Matthew 6 that you must forgive others because I forgive it. Because you know what? There's going to be healing when you forgive. There's going to be healing in your relationship with me. There's going to be healing in the relationship with that person, the other people, if they accept your forgiveness. Trust me. Follow me. Obey. And that means every single day because the goal is not to receive this knowledge and I've learned the lesson good. The goal is to live every single day trusting God, following Him that He will teach you until the end of your life. Until the end. That means every single day you're learning. You're a learner every single day. You're a disciple every single day. And the word disciple means methetes in Greek, which means a learner. When the disciples went to Jesus, two of them, then God, Jesus said to them, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi. Their first word was teacher, saying we want a teacher. Teach me. That is what it means to be a follower of God. It's not just words that you know in your mind. It's words that are applied in your life. And he's saying, teach me. Teach me. So the first thing we know, it's a teachable spirit out of the motivated by God's goodness and His eternal life and His preservation of life that He says, teach me and I want to follow your ways. And then second of all, He asks and He prays to God. He says, give me understanding. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law. Once again, so I may keep it so I can obey it and obey it with all my heart. It's my heart's desire to live this way that you want me to because you love me. It's my heart's desire. So give me understanding. Help me to understand what the Word of God is saying. Help me to understand how to apply it. And then the most beautiful thing that we've just been through in our series on the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us understanding. John 16 verse 13, Jesus was praying and He was praying to the Father. He was telling His disciples, guys, I'm going to send you the Spirit, the Spirit of truth. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth for He will not speak on His own. He will hear and speak on the authority of God. That's what Jesus promised. So he's hearing from God the Father and he's coming and he's inside of us and he's with and he's saying, okay, let me, let me explain to you. Let me give you understanding of what this, Bible, this scripture means. And let me help you to apply it in your life because I will the one be the one who will show you how to put it into practice. If you ask, if you ask, ask of me and I will give you anything. And that's what Jesus means by asking. And so this prayer, if we're really honest with ourselves and we say, God, teach me and give me understandings, God's going to answer it. What He's asking for is an open heart. An open heart. To say, this is the life that I don't want to live. Help me. Direct me in your paths of your commands, the third prayer. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. You see, there it all comes to conclude, comes to that one moment. I enjoy that way of life. I've seen this way of life. It's not good. I've learned from that, because he says in the next verse, turn my heart towards your statutes and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes from worthless things. I've seen that. That's the worthless life. It's not worth anything. I've experienced, I've tasted and seen you, your glory, your beauty, and your good ways. Lord, now now guide me, direct my path. And that's where the word comes in. Because the word is a lamp unto our feet which shows us which way to go. And so we open. We open to be taught. We open to put it into practice. Because it doesn't help me learning about golf or fishing or tying knots. And I don't practice how to tie the knot. 
I'm not going to catch a fish if I don't tie the knot. I'm not going to follow if I'm not following what Jesus has taught me to do. And I'm open that. And He's directing my path. And then God, will prom- God promises He will direct us. He will be with us, His presence. He will give us His power to direct us. He will give us purpose in our direction of life. He will give us protection and He will provide for us in that. If we're only willing to commit our lives fully to be able to be learners for the rest of our lives. And that's what the disciples had to do. The disciples had to make that decision. There's a story where Jesus is talking to 5,000. And, the, and he breaks and, and he feeds the 5,000 with the fish, a miracle. And after that, he teaches them, and he teaches them that I am the way to life. I am the bread of life. And many of the teachers of the laws and many of his disciples go read that passage in, in John. And many of his disciples come and, and, be, and, and, and say, but how, what do you mean by this? And he explains to them, I'm the bread of life. You've got to come to me. I'm the one that you've got to follow. And because of that, Many of his disciples left him. Many of those who thought they were followers left him because they couldn't understand it and they didn't have the desire to follow Jesus. Then the twelve come and the twelve talk to him and then he asks Peter, Peter, do you also want to go? And Peter says, no, God, where shall we go to? Because there's no one else who's going to preserve our life. There's no one else that gives us the word to life. There's no one else that is the bread of life. There's no one else that knows how to teach us how to live the life that you want to live us. So Lord, we're willing to follow and we're willing to put into practice. And we also know then that God is patient. Because it is a lifelong journey. Because Peter didn't learn in a day what it means to follow Jesus. He committed himself as a lifelong learner to follow Jesus. Are you a committed, lifelong, teachable learner? And that's what our heart is as a pastor. We want to guide you. We want to teach you. We're also learning as we go. Discovering that our old nature is wrong. Discovering that there's things in our lives which need to change. And and being challenged by Jesus to follow Him with everything. But we're on this journey together. And so let me ask you. Be honest with yourself up to now. Do you have a teachable spirit? Are you learning from God and His Word? Are you opened up in His book and reading it and asking God, help me, Spirit, to understand what it's saying? Are you willing to to do veritas, where we teach you how to understand God's truth even further through the work of the Holy Spirit? Are you willing to commit yourself that when you're listening to a sermon, you're actually listening because you want to be taught? You're not going to church because you want to hear, because that's what you've got to do. You want to be taught. You want to put this into practice. So I want to challenge you. Open up the Word of God. Open up to the book of Matthew, to the book of John. Start reading it. Start asking God, God, what is it in here that you want me to obey with my whole life and follow for today? Let me pray. Jesus, let me pray. Jesus, I want to commit my own life to be a lifelong learner, a follower. Because you, only you, are the way to life. You are the resurrection and the life. You are the bread of life. You're the life giver. You preserve my life. And you're saying, if you follow me, you'll stay out of harm's way. With regards to sin. Temptation. So Lord, I want to pray for each and every person who's willing to take up this this challenge to be followers, not just knowing God's word, but actually putting into practice. And perhaps you've spoken to them right now already about something that I need to do right now. It's going to be a take a big step. It's a big step to say I want to be teachable, but it's even a bigger step to say I'm going to put that now into practice. It's two massive steps of faith. And so I want to pray for those who are listening that are challenged, that know what they must do. And Lord, I pray that any barrier, that Satan won't stop them to do what they must not do anymore. That they'll turn away from their sin. That they'll take that step. And Lord, Holy Spirit, help them to do that. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
We get a chance now to thank God with our offerings. So may you do so out of joy in your heart. Who is like you, Lord, in all the earth? Matchless love and beauty, endless worth. Nothing in this world can satisfy. Cause Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Your presence is heaven to me. Your presence is heaven to me. Treasure of my heart and of my soul In my weakness you are merciful Redeemer of my past and present wrongs Holder of my future days to come you as the father just expresses his love towards you as you realize that Jesus by the grace of him you are saved and you remain in him and the Holy Spirit's in you as he teaches you God's ways Amen God bless and goodbye <laughs>